There are three reasons why I'm honoured to speak with Mark Tinson, Newcastle's legendary godfather of rock today. Firstly, he's right up there with Malcolm Young from ACDC as far as rhythm guitarists go, and that right arm of his is magical. Secondly, he's lived the rock and roll dream. He's toured the country with some majorly successful rock and roll bands. He's had record deals with major labels. He's also written some great songs. He's been a producer. He's done some amazing things. And thirdly, his contribution to the local industry. He has been a writer, a producer, and most of all, I guess, as well as a performer, he's been a mentor to a lot of local people and been, done some great stuff for the local industry. So without further ado, here's a talk with Mark Tinson. So, welcome to Mark Tinson. And firstly, Mark, very impressive. You just Thank you. released a book called Too Much Rock and Roll, Thank uh, A Life in Music. I, um, might, I might add, Too Much Rock and Roll is like, how many is enough guitars? It's like just one <laughs> Never more. Enough. You know? <laughs> just one more. Mark, you've had an amazing, amazing musical journey. Um, you've had hit records, you've played on Countdown, you've toured Australia with nationally successful acts, you've become a producer, you've won several awards, um, and so much more. And now you've written a book. How long did it take you to write, and how did you go about it? Uh, look, it, it, I started off uh, spending about, you know, five hours a day on it, and, uh, and then it sort of took over. So I started about 14 hours a day, eventually, almost every day, except when I had to go out and earn a living. So uh, about four months of that. I figured out it probably took me as much time as if I'd recorded 10 CDs. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's like... I don't know if the returns will be... Uh, and did everything just come to you naturally? Did you remember um, everything or how did you...? No, no. <laughs> and in fact, at the beginning of the book, I, I allude to a, some conversations with Phil Screen, who was my drummer in Rabbit and uh, Heroes. And uh, he was always saying to me, remember when we did this? And I go, nope. <laughs> nah, come on, you must remember that, you know. And there's one particular story. He said, you know, when we played at Paddington RSL and and we played so loud, we broke the fish tank and there's fish all over the floor. Said, no, I don't remember <laughs> that. And he said, and Thorpey stole that story. Yeah. Go, no, I don't remember, but I'm going to go with, with what you remember, Phil, on that one. So. Um, so I guess to write the book, I just went, well, I'm going to forget everything if I don't write at least the bits I remember down. So, um, so you started with your memories and then yeah, got Yeah, and, and I just checked. It's, it's kind of chronological. So I just checked with different people that, that I had different things right. You know, it's like uh, one of the things when we played it um, in Melbourne with ACDC, they'd come back on the, uh, their very first tour of Australia with Brian Johnson. I thought, I'm sure we did Countdown before that. And I checked with the guys. No, no, we flew down specially for that. And I checked with our road crew. No, 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 no. Um, you did Countdown before it. And he had a backstage pass from that event. And it was on a Friday, and I went, that can't be right. Countdown was on a Sunday. <laughs> so I nutted it all out eventually. And it's funny what you forget is Countdown's recorded on Fridays mm. and then played back on the Sunday and then repeated the following Saturday. So I'd yeah. forgotten that. I've got a question to ask you about that day a bit later on in, the, okay. uh, in this. But the key driver in your life and career is your passion for music. Um, which is the greater thrill for you, recording the music or performing it live? Um, Look, I, th I think they're both got their value. Um, uh, I love when I've finished the record. I actually love recording drums. All the other bit is bits are kind of hard work. <laughs> then I like when I've finished the mixing process, I can listen back and go, yeah, that's all right. Um, the, the last CD I did, which is the Surf Cat CD, um, I approached it a little differently. I got some, uh, some national guitar players to join me on the CD and some international players. So a lot of it was done over the net. So I had to rely on what they thought. They sent it back to me. I edited it up a bit. So the actual strain of creating something was less. But I think the results were better because I wasn't telling them what was in my head. They were telling me what was in my head. You know? yep. So it's been an interesting process. You, um, as a rhythm guitarist, you talk about the wrist and the arm in the book and you're a particular type of player. Just yeah. tell us about that. Um, look, I'm very particular about having precise parts. Um, I think people that do this just wishy-washy stuff, it just drives me crazy, you know. Um, and one of the um, 
probably the most important part of my guitar playing. Now, um, I probably attribute to Phil Screen. He said, man, you've got to see this guitar player, Dizzo, Graham Disney, was playing a band called Mountain Jack. I said, man, go and have a listen to his sound. And he was playing a Les Paul through a Marshall, I think, you know. But what he was doing was getting a lot of those harmonics out of, um, out of his guitar, like uh, ZZ Top, you know, uh, Billy Gibbons. And, uh, and, and I was just watching how he did it. And he, he hit the string once and there, with his pick and then backed it up with uh, his nail. So it's like a double hit. So I went, hmm, I'm at it a triple hit. <laughs> so, I, so, well, I, the pick, the nail and the finger. So every time I do that, I'm hitting the string three times. You seem to do it straight arm, though. Yeah, I'll, I don't know. But <laughs> and so does Malcolm Young. Is yeah. that a... Well, and a lot of it's down. So as soon as you go up and down and up, it starts to get wishy-washy. So a lot of my playing is all down strokes. So every, every uh, hit is forceful. You know? Yeah. So, you know. It's a good reputation to have. Yeah, yeah. And it got you some places, which we'll talk about. Yeah, okay. When I read the book, I got a strong sense that this wasn't just a journey for you, it was the journey, the only journey for you. Music yeah. was the only choice for you. Yeah. How did you come to that realisation? Oh, no. Well, it's the realisation is... in the book, it yeah. goes back a long way. It does, you know, and I should probably get out more. But <laughs> 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 look, it's just what I've been interested in. And, and all the opportunities that have been afforded to me have been musical opportunities. And a lot of it's about the people I've met uh, along the way. And actually going, if somebody made me an offer and I went, instead of going, oh, I don't think I could do that, I go, oh, I'll give it a go. You know, so I've tried a few things that I go, oh, I don't need to do that again. But I think it, you, not, a, not only do you learn some skills, but you actually create a new network when you throw yourself in, in the deep end somewhere. So um, I've got a fairly wide network and it's, it's starting to, intrude into the rest of the world now. Mm. Yeah, so. yeah we'll, we'll talk about Chris Spedding a little bit later on. Okay. Um, but first I want to talk to you about a band called Rabbit. Mm -hmm. And um, Rabbit, I remember getting too much rock and roll and there was a poster in it. And I've yeah. got that poster. I was a you. fine looking man. Wasn't <laughs> <it>? <laughs> Dressed up in all that glam gear. So you mentioned in the book a Melbourne ballet store near where you lived. At no, no, it was in Randwick. In Randwick, yeah. in Sydney, was it? Yeah, okay. yeah. Sorry, I got the wrong place. And you made an investment in $3 candy striped leotards. Instead of the $2 plain colours. Instead of the $2 plain colours. And you'll colors. notice the other guys went for the planes, you know. <laughs> and they probably, they might have had a bottle of beer that week. <laughs> you know, so they couldn't <laughs> they afford, couldn't afford, afford the extra, extra dollar, dollar, you know. <laughs> but so I didn't, didn't have drink, so I didn't have the bottle of beer. So, so I've I got two questions for you about yeah. that. Why were the candy striped leotards a good investment for you, in particular? And secondly, how did Rabbit's Glam look come about? Uh, Look, I think the candy stripes were just a point of difference to the rest of the guys. Um, but it just meant we didn't have to buy any more stage clothes. It's like, OK, you've got two pair, you wash one after the gig and put the next one on, you know. So uh, it was fairly cheap uh, costume. It, where, we, where we blinged it up uh, was with our tops and our belts and stuff like that. The glam look, uh, look, all of the bands that we were interested in, uh, had a kind of glam element you know if you get past the early 60s with the who and stuff you you start to get into to bands like slade and um, the sweet yeah, and the sweet and and all that british glam rock stuff was not only great music but it looked good it's what people dressed it up it's like the antithesis of, of all of that grunge stuff that came out where they had to look even worse than their audience you know uh, so I, I, when I go out, I like to see, oh, they've dressed up for me. That's yeah. good. Yeah. An entertainment factor. Yeah, yeah. So where did it come from? Oh, look, I think probably Kiss heavily influenced us. Um, and the boots. I mean, they were really expensive at the time. I think 300 bucks for a pair Whoa. of boots. But they had heels that high. And mm. They were silver. And, you know, so. When I first saw you on the cover, and long before I met yeah. you, um, you seemed like the archetypal rock and roll guy you know, the sex, drugs, rock and roll. But you're an anomaly. You are not into drugs and you don't drink alcohol. Yeah. But you do write in the book your, about your first <laughs> taste of alcohol. Tell us about that. <laughs> oh, no. Look, I was at Maitland Town Hall and at a dance. Yeah, and <laughs> at a look, dance. I, I don't know if I was even old enough to drink then. Um, but, you know, there was drinks there and I had two fluffy ducks. Two which, fluffy which ducks. Which were ad, ad, Advocar and Lemonade, you know, which is a 
dreadful way to spoil the lemonade in retrospect. And uh, I got up to dance and my legs literally collapsed under me. <laughs> and I went, oh, I don't think I'll ever do that again. And you never have. I never have. And that was the end of alcohol for you. Yeah. And I don't really like the taste of it. You know, I think people really try and work at getting a taste for alcohol and they, most of them achieve uh, you know, mm. a liking for it eventually. Not me. Okay. Uh, Speaking of Rabbit, um, Rabbit's lead singer was Dave Evans, who was he still also, is. And still is. <laughs> He's also ACDC's original lead singer. Still is. Still yeah, is. It will always be. Yes. What's it like working with Dave Evans? Look, it's, it can be hard work. Um, Dave and I clashed terribly at times. Um, I'll say, I think he's got a, a really big heart, but he can be a little bit too bombastic. Um, and, you know, at times hard to be around, but at times, you know, a great pleasure to work with. You know, the, the guy can sing. And you know, a great front man. Yeah. And, you know, a different front man to our original vocalist in Rabbit, which was Greg Douglas. And Greg, Greg could manipulate an audience, you know, almost to jump off a cliff like a bunch of lemmings. He was very good at it. and. Uh, and when Dave joined the band, he just had to step into Greg's shoes, really. So the, the um, developing an image, we'd already done that. So Dave kind of stepped right into that. He had a bit of a glam look. Um, he, could, he could sing well. And I mean, we thought, well, you know, we can make a good record with Dave. He, he sings, sings well. Um, it, it was a bit more of an aggressive um, persona that we adopted after uh, Dave joined. And that was probably more about his his uh, on stage personality than the rest of us, but uh, you know I think, think he served us well. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> yeah. It very much fitted the rabbit days. Yeah, absolutely. When you were recording with Rabbit, you got to work with two famous producers, Peter Dawkins and Richard Lush. Yeah. Um, Richard Lush, of course, worked at Abbey Road with the Beatles. Yeah. How did they shape the producer part of who you are? Um, look, I, all through that recording process, I mean, you couldn't go to school and learn recording. Um, so I was just lucky that we were thrown into studios and uh, worked with personnel that, that were working with the very best. And I think I just learned lessons every day. And just even things like where they put the microphone, you know, how to talk to people. Um, uh, but Peter Dawkins, I think, uh, he was he came into our lives. We'd already been signed to CBS and made a record with uh, a producer called John Egerton. So when Peter came on board, he, he reshuffled CBS enormously, uh, signed up drag and air supply, you know, he, the guy could hear, hear a good song and, and know that he had a hit. And he, was, he inherited us, and I think he was a little bit, what do I do with these guys, you know? And we met with him and we thought we'd get sacked, because you know, we, we didn't fit the mould of the people he was signing up. But you know, to his credit, I think he liked us, just as people. and. Um, he, he gave us a chance to prove ourselves, and uh, when I wrote too much rock and roll, I think that's that's when I sold him. Yeah. So, so he went, yeah, okay, now, now we can go. Song. And it was only recently, actually, I always thought that the guitar answered too much rock and roll. Rear, 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 rear. I always thought that was a whammy bar, but you haven't told me recently. No, it's it Dave Hines on his Les Paul. He's Terry Les Paul. Bending strings. Dear, rear, rear. And thank you, Dave. <laughs> and, what a, and what a great sound. It's, yeah, it's and, and really, up. and that guitar line that he put in is, is a secondary hook for the whole song. So, yep. you know, a lot of the success of that song is down to Dave. In the bookmark, you include track by track breakdowns of each album um, by Rabbit, Heroes, Steelville Cats, and more. Tex Pistols. Yep. What it, did, it made me want to go back and listen to the albums oh, with, again could I? with your perspectives and in you'll, mind. You'll need the remastered copies then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was that your intention? Uh, look, look. I, th I think with with the book, uh, with uh, other autobiographies that I've read, there's so much of people telling how they behaved badly, and you know. I didn't have any of that. <laughs> so I thought, well, what, what's the point of difference that I can do with my book? So I thought, well, I can let people in on where songs came from, uh, how I felt about them in retrospect. Uh, I don't think I really had much of a plan, you know. <laughs> don't attribute me with too much forethought on this, I thought. <laughs> and I do actually include a, a beware readers you song do. before that. You know, so, They're boring bits. <laughs> yeah, might, they might bore some readers. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, I was just reading a review of, of uh, 
know, a Jimmy Barnes book and, you know, a lot of the, the, the writer says, you know, it, for him it was a, a healing process for Jimmy Barnes, I mean. And he had to write that to get rid of a whole pile of baggage. You know, most people go and see a psychiatrist, but no. <laughs> he gave us two books. Yes, <laughs> uh, but not uh, for you. No, not for me. But, um, uh, you know, I, th I think this is a point of difference for the book. And I didn't actually have to clean out too much baggage, you know, so it wasn't a cathartic thing or anything for me. It was just, well, what do I find interesting? And I find interesting people discussing their work. So I found it interesting. Yeah. As I said, it makes me want to go back and listen to the albums yeah. because I learnt things that I yeah. didn't perceive the yeah. first time. Um, you say in the book that you are still proud of too much rock and roll. Yeah. What makes you feel that way about that? Look, I think Rabbit and that version of Rabbit um, was a great band to play with. You know, Dave Hines was my sparring partner on the guitar, still a great friend, still one of my favourite guitar players. So it was a joy to work with him because uh, he's a great player, you know. But also we had our image, we had the songs that suited the image. Everything made sense, I think, about that band. Um, you'll notice there's a, a section I've written called The Identified Patient which uh, came from a, a counselling friend of mine. We were discussing it and it's, it's, bands are like a dysfunctional family, or can be. Yes. So if there's one person everybody picks on, they're called the identified patient. And um, I think the bands that followed Rabbit, we had a struggle with identifying <laughs> who we were going to pick on, you know, because when we left Rabbit, I had Phil, Jim and myself from Rabbit joined by Peter de Jong, so... The heroes. Yeah, from, and um, so in the bands he'd been with before, Pete was, I guess, you know, the alpha male. Um, any, anybody that uh, uh, was the identified patient in that band wasn't him. Mm. <laughs> in Rabbit, we had identified patients, and it wasn't, I think, either of the three that came from Rabbit. So you get this collision of, of people. We didn't have an identified patient. <laughs> and I think in a lot of ways that um, uh, uh, chemistry was a little bit flawed, whereas Rabbit, you know, there's a couple of guys we could blame, you know, for, for if things went wrong. So who was the identifiable, the main identifiable patient in Rabbit? I can't say. You can't say? <laughs> or, or maybe it's in the book. But the thing about the identified patient is it can a shift from one person to the other, whoever's behaving the worst at the time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Or whoever's not in the room, it's, it's another one. In the book, you don't hold back on some things. Um, there's some bits in there. <clears throat> For example, you mentioned Mark Holden, his carnation pop star days and as a judge in Australian Idol, and you use the great line, the bland leading the bland. <laughs> Is that how you see that side of the industry these days, with oh, Idol and I all just think it's awful. And I think it creates an unrealistic expectation for the performers that are involved. Because you see, occasionally, uh, you know, I, uh, um, that's forced upon me. Because Julie, my wife's a singing teacher, so that kind of culture is, is infused into the young. So her, a lot of her, her uh, students want to be on Idol or whatever. Yeah. And I just think the expectation is that I'm, I'll go on and I'll be this good that somebody will sign me up and blah, blah, blah. And you look at these shows and these people are singing for a minute in front of a, a hyped up audience. And they come out and they think that people love them. And I just think those shows, I have to remind myself, it's not a music show, it's just a dreadful, dreadful TV show. <laughs> yeah. Well put. <laughs> and you know, the, those poor kids, they come out of, of that uh, experience and they've nowhere to go. Yeah. You know, they can't do a whole night. They can't even do a, a, an hour and a quarter. You know, they've done a minute each time. Yeah. So, you know, then they, I think the realisation might come to them, oh, actually, I have to do some work now. And if they do the work, they'll probably do okay. Mm. But you can't not do the work and be successful. No, yeah. very true. Yeah. You include a, a few controversial statements in the book as well as the dear, oh dear. judgment on Mark Holden. Look, um, you know, you, when you look at Mark Holden, uh, the judgment I made of Mark was that his stagecraft was really poor back then. He came out, did his two singles first, two hit singles, yeah. hitish singles. Then he had to fill up 20 minutes with dross. Mm. The kids hated it. Mm. You know, just go, do the dross, then the hit singles. That's the last thing they'll remember. They'll love you forever. But, you know, Mark's been a very successful businessman and he's written some good songs. Mm. 
Yeah, but also he's got a DVD where he plays down in Melbourne and um, with all these fantastic musicians, including yeah. Mike Rudd and Bill Cup. Yeah. Um, and it's a great DVD. And if you um, if you don't like Mark Holden, it's a bit of an education. Um, check out that DVD. Um, you also include comments about Dave Evans. Yeah. Arnold Frollo's was an interesting one. Who, uh, for those that don't know, worked at the time worked for Triple J and was yeah. the arbiter of what Triple J played. Yeah. And also you comment on alternative music and the definition of alternative music yeah. on page 68 of the book. Did you hesitate before putting these comments in or you felt that they needed to be there? Oh, look, I think a lot of the book is observational and I, I guess that comes from my craft as a songwriter. So if you're a songwriter, you'll hear one phrase and you go, oh, that's, that's a song. Yeah. That's like, uh, I was in New Orleans and um, I walked past one of the sleazy clubs and out pops this American Portly gentleman in a safari suit, you know, it's like, really? <laughs> yeah. And uh, with a, a gorgeous blonde on each arm. I went, oh, wow, look at that stereo blonde. <laughs> and that became a Tex Pistol song. So uh, the observational side of it, um, I think those articles that I wrote for the Post, uh, which is what you're alluding to there, um, I just looked at how it looked to me and, and commented on that, made an observation. Uh, with Arnold Frollo's, that was, I'll have to say, this is hearsay evidence only from the Screaming Jets, you know. But he, you know, he did say, I can't play the Screaming Jets anymore after they'd been big supporters of the Jets. Um, I th the Jets won the, the national, uh, would have been double J then, I guess, or triple J, I don't know, uh, Bangkok. Mm -hmm. So they were big supporters, then suddenly they stopped playing them because they were too Popular. mainstream. Yeah. It's like, really? Yeah. Uh, and they were still playing Kylie because Kylie had gone, gone so far to the right, she'd come back around to the left. <laughs> really? And I've got another And question. as I again say, hearsay evidence. <coughs> I've got another question about yeah. radio a bit later on, but I want to take you back to 1976. Okay, let's, let's you, hope you I remember You saw ACDC in 1976, or actually I want to take you to 1981. Yeah. But you saw ACDC in 1976 at the Bondo Lifesaver. Yeah. And then again in 1981, supporting them at Melbourne's Maya Music Bowl after recording for Countdown. Yeah. Tell us about that day. Yeah. <laughs> as I remember it, <laughs> as, as I've been prompted to remember. Look, normally I think we got to Countdown about nine o'clock in the morning. So it's a, it's a, and it was a long day because you'd rehearse the show. And by rehearsing the show, you had to play your song or mime your song. Uh, vocals were usually live. And that was just so the cameras could get their angles. So the director could go, okay, this part, this part, this part, I'm gonna use this camera, this camera. Um, and it was tedious, you know, but um, I think we rehearsed three times before we did the show. So it was a long, long day. And then, you know, they let, let the kids in and then rah, 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 the show was on. And then it was on, we, we were done. So we had to, when, as soon as we'd finished our spot on the show, not even till the end of the show, we were whisked out into the, the hire car and driven to the Maya Music Bowl. And, uh, you know, we had 10 minutes to get ready to go on stage. So it was a bit of a schmozzle and, you know, it wasn't our best effort that day. And uh, fortunately, I think some of the reviews that weren't as um, flattering as they could be, uh, I think people confused us with little heroes. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, who, who were around kind of yep. at the same time and then yep. had that, uh, that hit with something about England. Mm, yeah. And uh, it was a pretty good song. So, you know, a lot of the, the negative reviews were probably attributed to Little Heroes. Yeah, so, ah. <laughs> Poor Little Heroes. <laughs> yeah, what a, what a weekend. You know. After Rabbit, there was the Heroes. That, yeah. was, that was what followed After Rabbit. Yeah. But, you know, to, just to, to move on, with ACDC that night, it was just glorious to see them come back, even with Johnson, you know, who, you know, Bon Scott's still my favourite ACDC singer. But it was such a great show, you know, and such a great catalogue of music. And... Um, you know, a, a great feeling in the audience. You know, I was out the front watching them. And yeah. yeah. So you hang around to watch the show. Oh, absolutely. So with the Heroes, so yeah. after Abbott, Heroes was the next band and a great band. They recorded an album for Albert, had a hit or two, um, became famous for playing the Night of the Star Riot, of yeah. course, in 1979. Well, we actually became famous before that, before we were signed to the record deal, you know, so we were signed to, to Albert's largely because of the notoriety we achieved. The, well, yeah. the question I was going to ask you is what did the, that night, the Star Right night, do for the band at the time? Oh, you know, gave us a record deal. Uh, you'd have to go, ultimately, uh, once you get a record deal and start doing the slog, 
you start to make less money. And the point with the heroes was, we'd put together a band that nobody could touch. You know, you just go, that band's popular, this band's popular. Combine the two, which was, was Armageddon and Heroes, and nobody's going to come near us, you know. And that's what happened. And we worked seven gigs a week. Um, there was a two-year period where we we actually worked every single night. Seven gigs a week. Yeah. Those were the days. Yeah, <laughs> they were the days. Some, so, well, not every night. We did two on Saturdays and took Mondays off, I think. So. Great band, though. And well, incidentally, they were the first band I ever saw when I, because I come from a country town yeah. up on the north coast. Yeah. I was born here, moved there, came back. And when I came back, you were the first band, the heroes were the first yeah. band I saw. And the power, yeah. just the sheer power of that yeah. band was incredible. And, and I think a lot of that was just how much we played. Yeah. It's, it's like the Beatles going to Hamburg. It's like they played for eight hours a day sometimes. You know, just got to get good. Mm. And so that was probably the making of them, you know. And, you know, we were a good band because we played so often. And yeah. uh, that's probably what's missing with the, the new, new uh, uh, crop of bands that we have now, they don't play enough. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of contributing factors to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in 1981, October 1981, there was an impromptu meeting of the heroes in a kitchen on the Gold Coast. <laughs> Take us through what happened and oh, why. You know what? I don't particularly remember that the, that <laughs> was one of the things that, that I, um, I researched with the guys in the band. Well, actually, but, when I interviewed Peter De Jong for your album release last yeah. year or the year before, yeah. um, Peter mentioned this yeah. night as well, an yeah. incredible night. Yeah. yeah, but you know, as I say, <laughs> the actual specifics of it aren't very clear to me, but I think we just went, you know, this is silly, we're not making any money, we're losing money. Um, if we keep losing money, we'll all go bankrupt. And you know, we, 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 were, um, we were pretty comfortable in Newcastle, you know, we, we had families, we had houses, you know, it's like, we don't want to lose those. So you made just, the decision to break up yeah. in the kitchen, impromptu, yeah. just... Yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah I but think it's probably in the back of all of our minds for a fair while. You know. Just from being on the road and not making money? I think probably just not making enough money was the thing. But when you came back to Newcastle, after making that decision, you came yeah. back to Newcastle and then what happened? We're in debt. <laughs> I was like, oh, somebody did the books. Oh, we're in debt. So we had to go back to Queensland and do another tour and Pope. wrap the debts up, you know, <laughs> it's like, ah. so not to give too much away, you know, you just go, if only we'd known what we know now, back then. I think we all had that. Yeah, <laughs> Lots of that's ways. hindsight. And, you know, we just didn't keep our eye on the ball enough mm. because we didn't have to. When we were just working as a, as a, uh, a covers act in Newcastle, playing, you know, four 40-minute sets a night and, and pretty fit because of it, um, all you had to worry about was turning up. You'd turn up, you'd play, and you'd get paid. Um, but you know, when it comes down to you've got to look at uh, recording, you've got to look at touring, you've got to look at accommodation, transport, you know, truck, PA system, road crew, all of that stuff costs money. And if you're not keeping your eye on it, suddenly there's money just going out the door and there's not enough coming in to match it. Yeah, yeah, the rock and roll story so, in a lot of know, ways. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, let this be a lesson to you young folk. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Another side of Mark Tinson, and I'm, I'm pretty sure most Novocastrians would know the altar pack jingle. <laughs> and it was a surprise to me. I'm I, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Apology. Um, obviously, I know the jingle. I've heard it a thousand yeah. times with the, the hand taps. Yes, yeah. that's it. Roland 707, drum machine. Yeah. Roland 707. Oh. I had no idea that you recorded that, yeah. but what was even more surprising was who you had sing on it. Yeah, yeah, Shauna Jensen and Maggie McKinney, who happened to be in town with Jimmy Barnes on, on the days that I was recording that. So I just gave them a ring, said, come on in, because um, they'd worked with me in Sydney, you know, they knew if they came, they'd get paid, probably on the spot, you know. <laughs> yep. um, and that was, um, you know, again, I worked in Sydney in studio, a uh, studio in Sydney, and I think my reputation down there was with the session players was that if they came in, they'd get paid that day. Uh, whereas a lot of the other people that hired them, you know, they'd be going around throwing rocks at their window four months later to try and get money out of them. So, yeah. um, you know, I think if you, if you operate uh, fairly and, and uh, you get a good reputation. So, you know, when I ring Maggie and Shauna, they'll come in at a drop of a hat, you know. Wow. So it's like, thank you, we're going to get paid and we'll have a good time. I've been listening to that jingle for 20 years or yeah. so or more, more, and I had no idea that yeah. you had such luminous. And I think the point with that too is it's like aeroplane jelly. It's like it's still around. It is. And a jingle 
might last 50 years or longer, you know, and there's a copyright issue there. Yes. Get paid well enough because what you're going to do is promote somebody's industry for 50 years. What's that worth? Mm. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's rhetorical. It's, <laughs> as um, much yeah, as they'll pay is the answer. Yeah. And it's like in America, they, um, they get paid residuals, you know, yeah. for every time it goes to air, and maybe that should be bought in here. But I'll move on. 1983. Well, just on that, an interesting thing with um, uh, jingle producers in America, um, a producer might go, you know, we need tambourine on that. I can play that. And my guitar part's really good. And mm, what if we put congas on that, you know? So suddenly this guy's got three, three uh, sets of residual he's, residuals he's looking at because he played three instruments. And you go, yeah. But Maybe one day we'll make it here. Yeah. No. Yeah. In 83, you, um, in the book you talk about Swanee and about negotiating to support the working class man tour. Yeah. Um, and about Swanee's gig post-mortems. <laughs> Tell us about those. Oh, but, He's, he's much better now. <laughs> Look, Joe, my, I, I love Johnny, uh, John Swan. He's just, just terrific. Great singer, really funny man. You know, he's got a heart of gold. But, you know, he was self-medicating back then, and that's fairly well documented, you know, in, by himself and in his brother's books and, and whatever. Um, but, you know, if we'd do a gig and, and, and he'd want to... I don't know whether it was even... The, a social thing, so that he could just to get to hang with the band. But you know, he was a boss, and he'd be he'd be he'd be going a few more miles an hour faster than us at the end of the gig, you know. And uh, he'd, he'd want to tell us what we did wrong, and you know, this said blah blah, blah and this has to change, and you know, you know, if, if I ever see you, blah blah blah, blah you know. And you go, okay, I'll just shut up. You, know, you did. You negotiated a better rate on that. Well, side. look, <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of my favourite things. Is that things, true? Yeah, one of my favourite things with Swanee was um, I, I tried to, to up our money for the whole band and they said no and kicked me out. <laughs> so the rest of the band stayed. But uh, after a few weeks, he, you know, I get the phone call, here, son, would you come back to the bank? You know, OK. And, um, but I want a little bit of a pay rise, you know, and it wasn't unfair. Uh, and this happened quite a few times. But when we did the, the tour with, um, with Jim Barnes, uh, it was supposed to be a double header, but it was obvious that we were the support act, you know, not from Jim's point of view, but from the, the uh, tour manager and the crew yeah. and stuff, you know. Um, but for some reason, John took it on, upon himself to sack the band a week before he went out on tour. And uh, he put together a new band, and typically John would never come to rehearsals. And um, Steve McLennan was the drummer at the time, and he had been made musical director, and he was the only guy from the old band that, that was in this new band. And he called John up after five days or something and said, man, you should come down here and listen to this, this is a shamozzle. So um, he sacked the band and then asked us to come back and play the tour, and we said, sure, but... <laughs> more money. <laughs> yeah, and no more, no more of these post-mortems where we have to listen to your rant and rave and blah, blah. And it was actually the best, most fun tour we did. You so know. he did stop? Yeah, he did, he did stop, as he yeah. was asked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But you know, as I say, yeah, John's, John's a dear friend, you know, and I always enjoy his company, and he is probably, you know, the greatest singer in the country. You know? mm. And his brother, for those that don't know, is Jim, Jimmy Barnes' brother. Yeah. And so the, it's in the talent, it's in the blood. It is. He went to the USA, New Orleans in yeah. particular, yeah. and it had a profound effect on you. Yeah. Um, you're particularly in relation to country music and Cajun music, yeah. roots music. What Look, I was only there. You, I was only there for a couple of days, and uh, uh, was travelling uh, with my girlfriend at the time, and uh, we just stopped in New Orleans for two nights. But we went to a Cajun restaurant that had a Cajun band in it. And, oh, we'll try the alligator. <laughs> the alligator. <laughs> it wasn't about the music. It was like, well, they got alligator. Let's try that. It's awful. It's like eating rubber. Uh, and uh, the band was just, something resonated with me about, about the band. And it wasn't that it was a great band, it was, it was the style of music. And it was a, it's a blend of, of French, country, because uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Cajuns, it's a bastardization of Arcadian. Mm. So they, they were driven out of Nova Scotia in the yep. 1800s or, or 1600s. 
and uh, a lot of them settled in the, the swamps and the and the uh, prairies, uh, just in just uh, east northeast of uh, New Orleans. So that culture of French mixing with the, the local uh, people that lived there too, which was mainly white white country uh, music players, you know, yeah. and the fact that they were playing instruments that was kind of left over from wherever, you know, fiddles and guitars and, you know, the percussion was uh, generally triangles made out of pitchforks, you know, ding, 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 ding. So, um, and I don't know what it was, it just... Something that, got into you. Yeah, though. it just went mad. That's and it's had... Fascinating. And it's had lasting effects, which we'll talk about. Before we get to that, though, also in 91, you went on the road with TMG. I did. And what was that like? It's great fun. They were all pals of mine. Uh, in fact, Ted Mulry had uh, recommended Dave Evans to be our vocalist when, when Greg Douglas oh. quit. So, and uh, that was because Dave briefly had sung with Les Hall and Herm Kovac in the Velvet Underground, um, which was an Australian band, not Lou yep. Reed's band. Yeah. Yep. And uh, Ted stole Les and Herm to go on the road with him. So uh, Dave, Dave didn't have a job anymore. And he came up and tried out with us. And, I mean, he was really committed. He moved from Sydney to Newcastle briefly to to play with the band, um, uh, but playing with TMG, so... All those great songs, you know, Dark Times, <coughs> Ball and Crazy well, and Jump well, In My Car. And Les is from Maitland, so we knew each other from Maitland. Um, Herm's from Raymond Terrace, but, you know, we, I mean, we were good friends, and uh, they were, they'd they uh, lost Gary Dixon, the, the, the uh, rhythm guitar player, and they were just sort of stumbling around really with different fill-in guys. One of them was Mick Cox from Rose Tattoo, which was probably... Well, <laughs> a bit heavy <laughs> for Ted. <laughs> it's like a, uh, that was a recipe for disaster, I think, just just uh, with the amount of drinking that, that went on. So I actually suggested to them, you know, that I'd be a good replacement. And they went, you know... Yeah, my... <laughs> <laughs> so um, they gave me a date. I turned up, played the songs at the gig, you know, no rehearsal. and. Uh, I stayed for 10 years. And you got to play with them again last year at Belmont 16s. I, I did, saw you on yeah. stage there. Well, they've reformed and, you know, obviously Ted's been uh, gone for 16 years now. Um, so uh, they've, Steve Mulry, his younger brother, is out playing with, playing with them now. Gary Dixon's back in the band, so, yeah. And uh, Good they, just, they just asked me to sit in and, yeah, sure, why not? Yeah. Mark, you've worked with so many great local musicians, Pam and Les Gully. Total Fire Band, Hugh J. Neal, Steve Mack, DV8, Hornet, um, and so many more. One was Tony Johns, who recently released an album after some 20 years after he actually recorded it with yeah. you. Tell and us yeah, how all that came about. Look, look, Tony grew up just down the street from me in, in East Maitland, and uh, so I was a friend of his family, and he was always like little brother. And uh, I used to uh, hang out with his next elder sister. And uh, so, Eventually, when, he, when his career, like he just picked up the guitar, started singing, you know, so occasionally he'd ask me how to play a chord or whatever. Um, but, you know, he built his own career. And when it came to recording, um, we, we kind of met again through Studio 21 that Peter Anderson was running. And uh, I think we made a great record. Uh, it was called Back in, Back in the Hunter Valley. Really good songs. We used A-list musicians, country players to, to play on it. And uh, we went, well, well, let's do another one. So we recorded another one, except for the vocals. And when he was about to do his vocals, he, he, he got uh, uh, a, a disorder that made it virtually impossible to sing. You know, he, he still talks with a bit husky, and uh, so it's, it's a bit like when your voice breaks, you've got no control of it. So uh, we thought, oh, well, we'll wait and see how it goes. <laughs> and 20 years later, I still had the files, you know, and we recorded the, that on tape. That's how long it had been. And I'd kept archiving it as, as I went through different stages of technology. I just suggested to him, why don't we finish that with, with different singers? And it was terrific because all of the singers put up their hand, you know, without any, any uh, prompting. And the funny thing was, the way we chose the singers for the songs, you'd swear the song was written for them. Mm. And uh, we had Kevin Bennett sing on it, who's one of my favourite singers in Australia, uh, sings with the flood. But we also had local guys, we had um, uh, Dave Carter, we had Michael Hawke, 
had uh, so he didn't have Dave Carter. He he sang at the concert. Had Michael Hawke, had Brian McVernon, Pete De Jong, you know, whole pile. Of people just went, yeah, I can do that for you. It was a great thing for Tony as well. I, yeah. I actually interviewed Tony yeah. at that release. It was a a massive thing for him personally. Yeah. And the song that you actually mentioned in the book was that which I mentioned to him in the interview is my favourite. Was the song about his father? Yeah, and he actually he in circumstance he's. His father was ailing and it was look, looking like he, he wouldn't be with us for long. And um, so he, he finished that song first. And it was before he lost his voice. Uh, so it's a, it's a good vocal performance, great song. So you were able to retrieve the original vocal yeah, yeah, from way yeah. back then yeah. and sweeten it up. And there's a years. couple of tunes that still have his vocal on. They're only guide vocals. And, you know, with the technology we've got, we've sort of, you know, could, uh, fix any tuning problems and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, it turned out really well. And, yeah, it, it was it was great for, for Tony. But, you know, I still use Tony for, for harp sessions. You can't, if I need a harp player, I always get He's Tony. Yeah. Um, Mark, you've, you mentioned in the book you've got quite strong feelings about radio and dance music these days. <laughs> How do you think their roles have changed and what impact has it had on the industry locally and in Australia? Yeah. Oh, I, when I grew up, as a kid in East Maitland, the radio was everything, you mm. know, and the music was fantastic. Uh, and if it wasn't fantastic, the station that was in competition, or the other station that was in competition, was probably more to, to my taste, so I'd listen to that station, and it would get so that I only listened to that one station, and I'd listen to that station because I liked the DJ and I knew he was going to play the music I liked. You know, people like Art Ryan, um, who's... Um, you know, he went on to have a career in, in TV and then advertising. But, you know, I used to listen to art on the radio and he's become a friend uh, in the last 15 years. And uh, we've actually done some recording together. You know, he's a good songwriter. But, uh, you know, it was really important. And there was a certain amount of autonomy afforded to the DJ. Uh, yeah. And when I say DJ, it's a person on the radio that plays records, yeah. plays discs. Uh, not a guy with a hoodie on and, you know, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> they Good drink impression. inordinate amounts of water. I don't know what that's about. The, these doof doof guys. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. So, but radio now. If you listen to radio, I don't like what what they play. You know, it's, it's just punishing. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of girl singers on now that we didn't used to have before. It's like, you know, where's the music? It's like it's, it's girls uh, showing us how well they can sing, and they can sing well. But you know, I'm just not interested. Do you think it's a generational thing because we're older? Oh, look, I think, I think the generation devours what's fed to them. You know, if they were fed something a little bit, uh, uh, you know, there was, if there was a bit more thought in what was fed to them, like vegetables instead of buns with sesame seeds on, um, they'd probably enjoy that just as much or even more. Mm. Um, I was just talking to a friend of mine, Pete Gray, the other day, and he said <coughs> one of the jazz musicians in New York some time ago actually said, you know, music's just not for everyone. <laughs> and you go, well, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. You know, maybe that there was more people interested in it back when I was a kid, or, you know, maybe there weren't the alternatives. You know, you didn't have an Xbox and you didn't have a screen this big for your telly and DVD and surround sound and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, yeah. And people often say to me that, you know, could that, be the cigarette smoke because people aren't allowed to smoke in <laughs> venues right. anymore. They're not interested in. Yeah. People ah. often say to me though that that era of music was it will never be repeated, and we're very lucky to have, have grown up with it. I just want to read through a list. You speak about being in New Orleans at the festival there, yeah. and this I, I'm not sure whether you actually saw all these people, but this was in one room at this festival. Randy Newman, the Neville Brothers, yeah. Bob Dylan, the Who, Robert Plant, and Jeff Beck. Yeah, is that? Did you see all those? Yeah, yeah. You saw yeah. all those guys in yeah. one room. What well, was not in one room. The festival is a, an outdoor event, mostly. Was so it a tent or something like that? There's, there's ten stages. So there's, there's uh, a blues tent, a jazz tent, uh, two jazz tents actually, a gospel tent, um, and then there's concert stages. Uh, there's a huge concert stage, a slightly smaller concert stage, and a slightly smaller one again. But you know, the, the fairground where it's at, which is like our, our race course. You know, there's two big concert stages going all the time. So if you, if you don't like that, uh, 
at a let's say Elton John one day. Maybe Emmy Lou Harris is up the other end of the of the uh, grounds there. Incredible pedigree to watch though. To, to just those people well, alone. Well, if you consider that New Orleans is in fact smaller than Newcastle, it has uh, really a disproportionate amount of the world's best musicians living there. And you know, you go, why is that? And it's just that's a magical place. It's you just go because it was a working port. You know, there's all of the influences musically from all over the world came through that port, yeah. and the the local musicians absorbed it. And you know, there's a lot of different uh, uh, racial uh, mixes in that music as well. You know, once upon a time, it was you know, white guys weren't allowed to play with black guys, but they would. You know, whether it be in the studio or in the mm. pub across yeah. across town where the police were afraid to go. You know. Uh, it's, yeah, it's extraordinary. It but is extraordinary. Yeah. Just those lists of names that you talk about in there. Yeah. I envy you for having seen them. I've seen Robert Plant, um, Bob Dylan, yeah. but I'd love to see The Who, you know. Fantastic. The whole windmill, yeah. Pete Townsend thing, yeah. which I've seen you do it, as well. <laughs> <laughs> he does it the other way. Does he? I do it like that. He comes around like that, oh. which is probably why he impaled his hand on his whammy bar once. <laughs> you know, Stratocaster, bang, went straight through his hand. Whoa. Yeah. So I never did that. If you do it that way, you don't you do go that. in the same direction. <laughs> I didn't know. It's like that. a grain, the grain in wood when you're, you know, making making something in carpentry. So you've seen, a, you've been to a lot of live concerts over your time. I have. What would be the best and the worst live concerts you've ever seen? Oh, I've seen a lot of bad ones, I guess. One of the most sublime concerts I saw was Amy Lou Harris, I think, at the State Theatre, with. Um, her spy boy, spy boy band, which was um, Tony Hall, who, who worked with the Neville Brothers and now works with um, uh, Dumpster Funk, which is uh, the, the creation of um, Ivan Neville, one of the, the royal family of funk of, of New Orleans. Um, Brady Blade on drums and Buddy Miller, who's just one of my favourite guitar players. It's just a little three-piece band and it was extraordinary. Another one that's almost like going to church was Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen. Up at the, the vineyards. It's an extraordinary concert. And a religious yeah. experience. Almost. Yeah, yeah. almost. Now you've recorded, produced three albums of guitar music. Two is the Steve Barely Wilkes. enough, really, is it? Barely enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> Too much two instrumental the, music. Yeah. Two is the Steve Wilkes. Yeah. And one, a new one as the Surf, Surf Cats. Cats. Um, where you managed to secure Chris Spedding. Um, tell us about the trilogy and the new album and how yeah. you got Chris Bedding. Uh, look, the first two of all cats, without giving too much away that's in the book, um, it was, I started out with some songs, trying to finish some songs I'd written for the Tex Pistols. And, um, you know, the, the unruly lot of pistols. And I thought, I don't know, and, uh, you know, and I, did, I couldn't finish for, uh, finish the lyrics for this song. And I thought, oh, well, what if I make it a little instrumental? And uh, then I, I got Mark Hoppy in to play, play on it. it Shoot, Lucy. This is great. This is, this, is, this is more fun than anything I've done. And, and you know, I get to hang with my favourite guitar players. So um, I stole some songs from other projects, got different guitar players to come in, then actually started writing tunes for the projects. So I think the second Steelville Cats album is even better than the first one because the songs, I knew what I was doing. I knew what I was writing for. And uh, this one, the Surf Cats, uh, the first two Steelville Cats albums, apart from the inclusion of Bob Spencer on guitar, who I made an honorary Novocastrian, they were all local guys. But this one, I thought, I'll, I'll go further afield. So I've got uh, a lot of Australian players that I've always liked, and that includes Tony Naylor from the Bootleg family and, and Pete Farnan from Boom Crash and, and Dave Russell, who, who came out here with uh, Ray Columbus and the Invaders, you know, yep. who produced uh, the first Metal uh, mental Notes album for Metal Split Ends. Ends. For Split Ends, sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, great players, you know, and especially Dave Russell. I'd seen him on, the, I think, the Long Way to the Top tour. I went, who's that guy? I think I've got to work with him one day. And, you know, it was a long time after, but I've got to work with him. And uh, a lot of the players are friends of other players, I know, so that it's, a, it's a big brotherhood, you know, and you ask these guys to play on it, and they go, yeah, I'd love to. But Chris Spedding played on a track, and I'd, I'd been, I'd run into Ross Hannaford from Daddy Cool, and yeah. Ross used to busk. The late Ross Hannaford. Yeah, he used Sadly. to. Sadly. Yeah. Great player, though. Just wacky <laughs> as well, you know? 
but he was... You saw um, him busking in a street one yep, day. Yeah, he used to busk in the Melbourne CBD. Mm. And uh, it was funny because I was staying in town with some friends and uh, I'd said to, to Julie, uh, gee, I wonder where Hannaford's playing. I'd really like to see him play. And we just walked down to get breakfast, as you do in, in <laughs> Melbourne CBD. And uh, there he was playing in the street. And so we sat and watched him for a quarter of an hour and I had a chat with him and said, man, would you, would you come up and play in Newcastle and, and record with me? He gave me his number, <laughs> which wow. I took wow. as an, with an implicit yes, you know. Yes. And uh, I got back to him and uh, he didn't reply for ages and ages on the email. And uh, he, he apologised, said, oh, look, I've been in hospital, I've been sick, you know. And sadly, he passed away before we could, could uh, mm. move on. But I'd written a song for him and I knew he was into reggae. So there's a reg reggae section in the in the surf salt, you know, beaches, Caribbean, you know, <laughs> reggae, yeah. And um, and uh, he died before I could get him to record on it. So I thought this song's really important, and I think I'd written a good tune. I want somebody really really good to play on it as well. And uh, I'd, I'd made contact with some uh, of, with a journalist in uh, Ireland, and he was an, an amateur musician as well, and. Uh, he, uh, he has a, an address book full of everybody in, in uh, the UK. So, if you got a number for, for Chris Benning, you know, sure. Wow. Uh, so, I uh, got in touch with Chris and he said, sure. You know. But you'll have to wait a few months because I've just started doing a production of the War of the Worlds in Soho. They, yeah. they followed into the theatre in Soho that uh, had been vacated by We Will Rock You. And I think he was expecting to work for a couple of years on the, on that show, but I think it only lasted six months. And, and interestingly enough, he also did a version of Jump In My Car. He did way, 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 way back. He did. But you know, I'd, I'd first heard Chris play with Robert Gordon. Robert Gordon was was one of the, the neo-rockabilly uh, performers who had some success. And he had success with Link Ray, who was one of my favourite guitar players. And if you've seen This Might Get Loud DVD with The Edge and uh, Jimmy Page, and uh, Jack, uh, Jack, what's his name from the... From the uh, what? Jack White, that's it. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that CD. No, I uh, That DVD. No. But, you know, Jimmy Page is in his mansion, I guess, in his record room, plays the first record that really turned him on. And it's Link Ray, Rumble. And you can see him just air guitaring. <laughs> and I just knew exactly what he meant. Because yep. you know? uh, Link Ray was, had that effect on me. Link worked with Robert Gordon. After Link left, Spedding filled in for Link Ray. That's where I came across Chris Spedding. <coughs> and, uh, and what a coup, though, for this album. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah great player. Really generous uh, with, his, with his time <coughs> and his ideas. You know, there's a lot of the stuff on there. I would have thought, now what can I do in this spot? And he just did it for me. <laughs> whatever it was, you know, whatever he did was great. You know. All right, here's a hard one. Oh. Who is? Your all-time favourite guitar player, and why? Pete Townsend. <laughs> why? Yeah. Well, he's a rhythm guitar player, essentially. Uh, plays pretty good lead, but um, he marries that rhythm guitar with extraordinarily uh, sophisticated songs. You, know, you listen to my generation, you might not go, that's sophisticated. But as you watch his career, the, the sophistication in the songs, his cutting edge use of, of technology, you know, he, he was one of the first guys to be sequencing synthesizers on his records and stuff like that. So if you listen to it, won't get fooled again, you know. Um, what a great think. song and what a great version of the heroes you used yeah, it was, to do. It was good fun. It was good fun. <laughs> well, it's still one of my favourites and, you know, you don't realise, well, probably people don't realise, but Townsend's playing the rhythm guitar parts and some, some parts he just goes <laughs> on one string, an open A string holds it for that long and you just go that's perfect <laughs> you could go -da -da, or you could go -da 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 -da, or, bah. that's it perfect um, and just uh, I guess the economy of his playing and he's got an incredibly quick right hand which I could never match you know if you listen mm. to Pinball Wizard so Pete Townsend's the, the Pete Townsend's the guy you know? and, and not just because he's a guitar player he's an intelligent man intelligent lyrics uh, sophisticated uh, harmonic structures have you got his book I have. Of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> in your book, we get rare glimpses of Mark Simpson's personal life. Only rare. Only, Only rare, rare, yes. You've been married twice and you yeah. have two children. Yeah. And you, but you, you tend to understate the highly emotional things to you. 
and I hope I'm not going to draw out too much here, but for example, the passing of Wayne Goodwin. Who was Wayne to you, and how do you actually feel about that? Oh, look, Wayne Goodwin was, uh, he's an Australian, uh, but he, his mum was a war bride. So, you know, he used to describe himself as half and half, you know. <laughs> half and half. But he'd spent time in America, and he toured with Emmy Lou Harris, and uh, he, um, I met him recording Swanee's Bushido album. He, he came in to do some string bits. And he, said, oh, he, he said to me many years later that I was the first musician he'd met in Australia. But he was such a good player and, and composer and arranger. And uh, when I started to investigate country music, which wasn't much later after that Swanee episode, um, I, I called him up to do some fiddle. And it was just such good fun and such great results that he was the only guy I used for a long, long, long time. But we, we became quite good friends and, you know, um, I don't know, what can you say? He, 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 he was a very insecure man too. He was funny. He used to do a comedy, comedy show as well, you know, and play Hendrix on the violin. I think he was on Red Faces or something as well. You know. But... Um, um, when he yeah. passed, you were affected. Yeah, you. yeah, but he, but he was he was very insecure man, and um, I think when he when he got cancer, he fought it for two years. And um, but one of the lovely things was that um, Crosby, Stills and Nash came out to tour, and he'd worked with them in in the states. And uh, uh, Nash actually came in to visit him at the hospital, and took him to the gig, brought him back to the hospital himself. You know, wow. not send somebody to pick him up. Took him there and took wow. him back. And I think he really, uh, he, he realised that how much people thought of him. And he was always worried about that, you know, I think he, he didn't realise how important he was to people. So, yeah, it was really sad, you know, and we've lost a few along the way. David Egan was another one, um, piano player from Louisiana, and he came out here and we recorded with him. And I just contacted him by email. I said, you've got a spare date here. You're not playing with a little band of gold. You want to come up and play <laughs> with us? And he said, sure. <laughs> Beautiful man. A big old bear, you know. Extraordinary songwriter. Great piano player. Great singer. And uh, he said, you know, I wasn't sure what I was getting in for. So I thought you might have just been a bunch of, you know, wannabes playing with the, with the old dog, you know. He said, you know, he had a great time. You know, he said it was great, worked with great musicians and met some great people. You know. Yeah. Last year you performed a show at Lazotte's with Rabbit, Armageddon, Heroes and your very first band, Bluegrass. Band. Yeah. Bluegrass. It was a hoot. The first time in 44 years that yeah. you played with Bluegrass. Yeah. What yeah. was that like? It was fantastic. And you know, the, I think uh, the highlight of the night for most people I spoke to was Who's that guy that sang in bluegrass? And it was Bob Hanley, you know. Bob's yeah. performed around Newcastle. Still. Yeah. And uh, but never, never in a band that was working and building up a, a, a good following and stuff that used to happen back in the '60s and '70s. That was great. And uh, you know, they're, they're really good people. <laughs> and just great fun to, to work with them all. and see them again. Yeah. Yeah. Forty-four and, years is a long yeah, time. And and um, they've all been, except for the drummer who had to actually get back into rehearsing, you know. They were all, all kept on playing, you know. So, and Bob's, what a voice, what mm -hmm. a voice. Yeah, you know? still. Yeah, and it's great to see Pete Young play with Armageddon again. Yep. <laughs> because they, that was the, the, when we put Heroes together. Who's the best band in town? Well, Armageddon. Let's take their lead singer. Remember, let's take their lead singer. Yeah. And, you did. and their bass player at the time, Greg Dawson as well. Mm, you did. Yeah. Um, you're launching your book, Too Much Rock and Roll and the new Surf Cats album, Atlas Ox on February 9, which is also your birthday. My 64th birthday. Your 64th birthday. Will you birthday. still need me? <laughs> Keep feeding me. So who and what can we expect on that uh, Look, it's, I'll, I won't say every band I've worked with, but yeah, almost is, you know, all members of. So you can expect to see uh, the Retro Rockets, the current version, uh, Raiding Party, and we haven't worked together for a long, long time. Time. <coughs> Will Can Candy be making an appearance? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Unfortunately, the, Jim Davis won't be there. He's on holidays uh, in uh, the Cook Islands. Okay. He can't come. Um, 
um, Mike Rudd from Spectrum is coming up. That'll be fantastic. To do a couple of songs. And, and Mike, we've made friends with Mike over the last few years. And uh, he's been really a generous man. You know, he contributed to my radio show many times. Uh, he came up and played for us. Uh, we promoted a, a concert at yep. Results. Um, he's recorded with me you know, you most know generously. You know. I think about someone like Mike Rudd, and if he was an American, he'd be revered and a, absolutely a, a god in music in America. So, but here he's, it's almost forgotten, yeah. except by, you know, the core purists. Yeah. But Mike Rudd is seri a serious legend who has contributed so much. And well, you know, if, if there's five top singles from Australian pop music history. I'll be gone. I'll be gone as well, you know, yep. along with Friday on the line, you know, yep. the real thing. Are you looking forward to 9th of February? Sure, and I'm, I'm even thinking about practicing. With, uh, uh, <laughs> oh, don't do that. But you know, I'll have Rabbit there and I'll have um, most of the heroes. And, um, <laughs> You're thinking uh, about practicing, wow. <laughs> and uh, Bluegrass will be there again. Uh, Les and Herm from TMG are going to Come and Sounds play with like me as it's well. going to be a great night. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I booked uh, early, so I'm, ah, I'm very much looking forward to it. There's only about 20 seats left, which is a, it's a great. It's, yeah. You know, it's a it, it's a great to see that there's support for, for something like this. You know. mm. It's um, in your role as as a mentor, and um, you've been such a mentor to so many people over mm. the years. The the music industry has changed massively during the time that you've been in the music industry. You've been a mentor, mentor to many over that time. Right now, what advice would you give to local musicians and songwriters that were just embarking into the industry? Uh, Final question, what advice would you give to them? To do it for the right reason. Um, and the right reason, I think, is because you love music and you want to play with people. Don't do it to get famous. Don't for a second think that you're going to get rich out of playing music. You know, um, if, if, if you want to be a full-time musician, Make sure that you're good enough at your instrument to teach that instrument because that will be part of your income stream. And the, the other thing that, you know, it might be uh, an observation that's going out of fashion, but whatever you do in the first 10 years of your professional career will serve you for the rest of that career. You know, all the stuff I did with Rabbit, Bluegrass, you know, Heroes in those first 10 years of being out there playing, that's, that's, pretty much my reputation. It's what supported me into teaching. Um, and you've and had a full-time career in recording. music. I have. All the way through. Yeah. Which in itself is an amazing achievement, as is this book. Well, um, thanks. <laughs> it's a great book. Um, February the 9th at Lazotz is when this is going to be launched, and along with the Surfcat CD. Yeah, and, and it's not terribly apparent, but this is a coffee table book. A coffee table and book. And it's full gloss. It's full of glorious photos. Can you skip those there? Yeah, and the photos actually come up better on these pages than they do in real life. They just look spectacular. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. And, you know, anybody so that's thinking be. of going to New Orleans, in the back there's a, a whole six pages, I think, of photos from my adventures in New Orleans that you could repeat yourself. And in the very back? Um, it's a right. CD of rarities, lost gems, um, and so, you know, stuff that you go, I've got a couple of tracks here. How am I going to release those? I can't think of a reason to release them. I know, I'll put them put in, them the, in book. the book. Yeah. <laughs> Great so idea. There's some recording I did with some Cajun guys in Louisiana in there. Uh, recording I did with David Egan and, and Mike Rudd. Played harp for me. So, yeah. It's what a package. Interesting stuff. So yeah. that's launched February 9th. 9th of February, 64th birthday. Uh, At Lazard. 64. And, <laughs> and only 20 tickets left. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sold really well. I'm really yeah. happy with that. Well, Mark, thank you very much for your time. Congratulations. Pleasure, I really Steve. look forward to February 9th. Cheers. <laughs>